those wonderful things. In uh, just a few minutes, we're going to have an intro video, but um, before that, uh, I'm going to make an introduction, and then we'll roll the intro, intro video. Um, my wife is preaching today, and I'm so excited to have her preach. Uh, you are in for a treat. Now, remember, after she's done, I'm still the pastor. I get to preach next week, all right? <laughs> so it's, it's, she's a great job, and um, before I met her, she preached all over the country of Nepal, and God used her in mighty ways. And uh, when I got to Nepal, a good friend of mine, who's uh, a good friend of mine, said, uh, "Brother, you preach good, but your wife preaches better." So, uh, so he's just lovely with compliments, isn't it? So, so all right. Without further ado, let's let's roll that video. She lets me stay up till eight o'clock while the while everyone else go to sleep at seven and seven thirty. By just loving me and showing that she appreciates having a daughter like me. Um, and you please tell me who I is. She helps me. She gives me stuff. <laughs> she doesn't get too mad at me when I do something like not very smart. She lets me lets us do stuff like go out and like do special stuff and she lets me do this. If I have a bad grade, she'll tell me about it. Tell me to fix it. By showing me love and telling me that I'm special. Mama, she shows me kindness mostly when she's not mad. Like daddy. Um, when she when she gets kisses out. Um, because she always does stuff for us and is always telling us that she loves us. Because she's always around me and she just doesn't leave me out there. She saves it. Gives me hugs and kisses. Because she always like she never like gives up when we do stuff. She always like keeps cheering us on no matter what. Uh, because she always puts me to bed. Because she's nice to me. She hugs me every day. Whenever we have like downtime together, we, we're always hugging. Hugs me every day. And you love me more in your heart. She shows it a lot. And she takes care of me when I'm sick. Um, spent her money to buy a playground for everyone. Again, she she cares. Because because she's so because she's kind and she and she helps me learn. Because she always gives me a kisses. Because she gives me kisses and hugs and snuggles me and is very kind. Because we're family. That she is loving and kind, and that she has two very beautiful children. <laughs> She's very pretty. <laughs> she takes me to the pool, and she lets me go in the sun. That she's there for me. That she It's awesome. 
Yeah, well, my son, there, not all the questions got put on there, just for time's sake. I asked about qu six questions to the kids. One of the questions that I asked was, um, what is a mom's job? And my four-year-old's answer was to do the laundry swap. There you go. There's my life summed up right there for you, to do the laundry swap. So uh, your children are hilarious. Um, and thank you to my amazing husband who put all of that together. I did the videotaping and asking of the questions. He spliced it, sliced it, put it all together. And so thank you. And I want to thank my husband, too, for this opportunity to come. Because without him and his covering and his encouragement and his just putting it before me, um, I wouldn't be here. And so thank you, babe, for the amazing man that you are. It's an honor and a privilege to be here on Mother's Day, to be able to speak into your lives and speak God's word. But before we get started, I know that Mother's Day is not for everyone in this room, um, a joyous occasion as it is for some. And I want you to know that you are not forgotten this morning. I want to, you to know that those of you that are here that might be feeling some pain, I've been praying for you, especially during this time of preparation for those of you that maybe have lost a mother recently, that there's still that pain of that loss. For those of you that um, your mom is still with you, but you don't have a good relationship with, and so this day brings hurt. For those of you that haven't able to been able to become moms yet, and that sorrow is there and that grief is there. For those of you that maybe have been adopted and the questions of identity come up every year at this time, I've been praying for you. For those moms whose children haven't turned out exactly as you envisioned them, and there's pain, and there might be guilt, I've been praying for you. And so this morning as we begin, I just want to pray for our service and our time together and to let those know, everyone in here know, that you have been prayed for, you are not forgotten, and we love you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords over each and every one of us. And Father, I pray that this morning, uh, for those that are sitting in here that might have heavy hearts, that God, you would be the God that comforts, that you would be the God that brings peace and joy to their lives, that Father, that they would walk out of this place knowing that they are cared for, that they are loved, that they are not forgotten on this day. Father, for those of you, for those of us that have come in rejoicing and, and ready to be honored as mothers, God, I pray that you would speak into our lives today, that we would walk away today being better moms, better people, better children of God today. We thank you and we praise you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to try very hard not to um, have to use my glasses to see my notes this morning. So we will see how this goes, but I'm going to, if I stumble, I'll throw them back on there. But um, this morning, the title of my message is Just Be Kind. And this is something that God has been dealing with me for the last several months. And our scripture this morning is Proverbs 31:26. And it reads, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. And God has been dealing with me over the last few months about this. Um, for those of you that don't know, we have six children in our home. And I see that uh, day after day, my patience is growing thinner and thinner. And um, I hear myself in the words coming out of my mouth, and I hear God over these last few months just saying, just be kind. Speak my kindness. Speak my love and my life into them with kindness. And so that is a personal journey that I've been going on for the last several months. And then I knew that this moment was going to be coming, that Brandon had asked me months ago if I would share on Mother's Day. Now, I have, again, six kids in my house, so I have about five-minute increments a day where, where no one is talking to me, where no one is touching me, and where no one is needing me. And so, because I knew this was coming, months ago, I began preparing for this because it was going to take me a long time with just five minutes at a time. And so I began praying. I'm like, God, what do you want me to share? What do you want me to speak on? Just, just show me what you want me to speak on. And he said, the very thing that I've been speaking to you about speaking with wisdom and kindness, I want you to share on Mother's Day. And I said, okay, great, but how do I do that? I am struggling with it myself. <laughs> what am I supposed to share? And this morning I feel that there are um, three main areas of, of kindness and 
and wisdom that um, we're going to look at. And the first one is what, what are words, what do we say to our children? The other area is what our children hear us say to others. And the third is what our children hear us say to ourselves. And again, as I was preparing this, I was like, God, but I'm so frustrated because I know what I want to be. I know I want to be a mom that speaks wisdom and kindness to my children every day. I get that. I want that. I want to be that person. I am not that person. How do I get there? What do I do? And there's, there's guilt and there's feelings of failure at the end of the day when I haven't again done all that I feel that I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to live this out. And so there are days, so with this whole kindness thing, I've been teaching it to my children as well. Because as my patience grows thin, you see my children's does also. And their answers become short with each other. And there's not kindness. And there's this whole cycle that happens. And so as God has been speaking to me about just be kind, speaking with kindness, I've been trying to instill that in my children. Guys, just be kind. Say it with kindness. You can say the same thing with a different tone, speaking with kindness. But there are days when you walk into my house and my children are fighting in another room and I am yelling across the house, just be kind! <laughs> Say it with kindness! Somehow it's not working. <laughs> it's losing the effect, <laughs> but we're trying. And so in this preparation time, as I've been seeking God, he brought me to, I found a, a sermon. And I've listened to this sermon in whole about three times, and in part, I don't know how many times, but it was really speaking to me. But I was getting frustrated because I'm like, God, this has nothing to do with the topic. But I was just, it was really ministering to me. And then after listening to it over and over, it finally hit me, well, wait a minute. This absolutely has everything to do with what we're talking about. It's going to lay the foundation for how we live this out. It's great to come and say, be kind, speak wisdom. How in the world do I do that every day? And so before we get into um, those three points that we just talked to, what we say to our children, what they hear us say, uh, what we say to others, before we get there, I want us to lay the foundation. The, the uh, message was by a, a lady, Christine Kane. And I just, without this foundation, we will fail every time to speak with kindness, to speak with wisdom. It's actually a foundation that we need in, in any area of Christian living. And she began, part of the sermon um, was talking about our physical core and, and the, the, the need for our physical core to be strong. And, and as, as our physical core needs to be strong, as that is true for our physical bodies, we have a spiritual core that also needs to be strong. Your core is the part of you that is responsible for every move you make. And I didn't realize the true, the fullness of the importance of our physical core until our three-year-old came to live with us. For those of you that don't know our family, we have four biological children, and we are foster parents as well, and we have two foster children in our home. And um, our three-year-old, he came to us when he was two. He's been with us for almost a year. And when he came to us, we started with a developmental therapist right away and, and speech. But the developmental therapist would come in, and week after week after week, she kept talking about his core his core and, and how his core was, because his core was weak, he couldn't do this, and his core was weak, so he couldn't do that. And, and I was like, is she just blaming the core on everything? Like, what's going on here? So I began to um, research a little bit more about this core that she was talking about because I wanted to know how to help him. And one of the, the things that I found was if the core muscles are weak, you can't breathe as deeply, lift as heavily, or move as quickly. On the Mayo Clinic site, I found most sports and other physical activities depend on stable core muscles. Weak core muscles leave you susceptible to poor posture, lower back pain, and muscle injuries. And so here I see 
this little guy who should be doing things that, that for, you know, for his age that he just isn't able to do. I see as he's sitting, he's just, he's just kind of all over the place. You see, he's kind of like jello. You know, he just, he doesn't, he can't sit up properly. When I have him on my hip, again, he's three years old. When I have him on my hip, he should be able to sit there on his own. He can't. I still have to support him. When I put him on my lap to tie his shoes, I shouldn't have to put my arm around him to keep him there. He should be able to sit up straight while I'm tying his shoes. He just can't do that. There are things that he just, he, he's not able to do. He's trying to run and kick a ball, things that a three-year-old should be able to do, but he's, he's clumsy with it. He can sometimes get it, sometimes can't. He's just, he's not there. His body's just not functioning properly. And it's because of that core, because that core was never strengthened. How many moms know the word tummy time? When you have your baby, you're doing tummy time. We're doing tummy time, aren't we? <laughs> There's tummy time. You put your baby, your infant on the floor, and you give them that opportunity to start working on that core, those very muscles that they're going to need for everything else, and it starts at a very early age. Well, we did it. We did tummy time because our doctor told us to do it. We didn't know exactly what would happen if we didn't. We just knew they needed it. Well, now I'm seeing in our three-year-old what happens when they don't get it. They don't have that, that foundation to build every other movement on. And so I'm watching it play out with him. So we're going back to the basics with him. There are times in therapy where we would actually put him on his stomach, just like you would an infant, for tummy time and have him do um, puzzles or, or some sort of activity while he's on his stomach, but again, trying to get those muscles that were never built up. And then um, a tunnel, you know those tunnels, those long little tunnels and you crawl through? I think we have a picture of my brother laying naked in one with cowboy boots on. You know those tunnels? <laughs> Hi, Adam. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we have this tunnel to crawl through so that he can work. Again, he's three years old, but working on those basic muscles, the basic core that just was never built properly so that hopefully as time goes on, that will build. But it's so much harder for him to do now because he wants to do the things a three-year-old should be doing, but it's clumsy and it doesn't look pretty. <coughs> Excuse me. So just as we have a physical core, we have a spiritual core as well. Our physical core is built up with a whole group of muscles that I'm sure Adrian could tell us all about. <laughs> and our, our spiritual core it's made up of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And when our spiritual core is weak, we want to change the world, but we're weak. And we're trying in our own strength. And just as if I try to do physical activities when I don't have my, my physical core uh, properly in line, I'm going to injure myself. When our spiritual core isn't right, when our spiritual core isn't strong and I'm trying to go out and live out God's word, it's not looking pretty. I'm not succeeding. I'm injuring myself because I'm going to fail every time. We hear a good message. We come to church and, and pastor challenges us and we walk away saying, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to conquer the world. I'm going to be that person. It lasts until like Tuesday. And we're back to where we were. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thursdays in our house are our rough days. Wednesdays for our three-year-old are extremely difficult, and we have a, a pattern of behavior that we see every Wednesday because of situations in his life. And so Wednesdays are hard, so he's exhausting those days, and so I'm worn out. Wednesdays we stay up late because of church, and so by the time Thursday rolls around, our house is really crabby. Don't come visit on Thursdays. I'm just warning you. Thursdays are rough. Everyone melts down. Uh, we try to have an, uh, um, something that we do every night so we're not just sitting around um, playing on screens and doing our own thing. So we try to do game night and worship night and book night and all these different things. Uh, Fridays are a pizza movie night. You'll hear the kids talk about that all the time. It's Friday. That's what gets us out of bed on Friday is that it's pizza movie. But Thursdays, one, every once in a while, the kids are like, let's do game night. I'm like, oh, no, we don't do game night on Thursday. Because game night with our ages were 10, 9, 6, 4, 3, and 2. Game nights on any night is going to end up with someone crying and upset somewhere. On Thursdays, it takes about two minutes for that to happen. And so we just don't do that. It's crabby time. It's, it's just, and so I found myself waking up on Thursdays already defeated. 
like, God, just get us through this day. I just, I just, I'm just trying to plow through this day. I can't handle it. <laughs> Let's just get through today. And I was waking up with this attitude. And I'm like, God started speaking to me about kindness. And so I was like, okay, God, show me how to do this. Show me how to change the atmosphere of our house. Because a lot of that depends on mom and mom's mood. And so show me how to change the atmosphere. And so I wake up Thursday and I'm praising God. I'm like, God, you've got this. Help us today. And I, and I was having conversations in my head with my kids as I was getting ready. They weren't awake yet. And I was just like encouraging them and like, we've got this. Come on. Thursdays are no longer going to be. Because the kids will say, oh, Thursdays are rough for us. You know what I mean? That's just that's there. And so I, I want to get out of that. And so I'm like, yes, God, we've got this. We've got this. Kids wake up. I think it lasted maybe a half an hour. And I was like, so Brandon comes in and I'm like, Brandon, I tried. I tried. I woke up. I was having a great time with God. I was doing my devotions. I was praying. I was excited about today. This was going to be different. And then the kids woke up. And that's what I said to him, and he just laughed. I'm like, I, I, tr I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. When our core isn't strong in our own strengths, in our own abilities, we are not going to be able to live out the godly principles that God has called us to. When our spiritual core is weak, we're trying to live out God's word through our broken hearts, through our wounded souls, and our tormented minds. Some of you have come today and your hearts are broken. They're clogged. They're clogged with unforgiveness, with bitterness, and with conflict in your lives. And without allowing God to clear that out, without allowing God to strengthen that muscle in you, so that you can love properly, so that you can, the scripture says, Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I want to speak kindness, I need to clear out the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the conflict that is in my life. I've got to allow God to clear that out and heal that so that then the abundance of his joy, the abundance of his kindness can flow through. But that heart muscle has to be strengthened and healed. And what about our wounded souls? You know, many of us came to Christ with a lot of wounds, with a lot of pain, with a lot of things that have happened in the past. And some of that is what has brought us to Christ. And when we got saved, God began to heal that, and we allowed him to in the beginning. But then there are areas of our life that we have padlocked and we have not, we have, we've said no one is getting in there. No one is going to hurt me like that again. I am not allowing anyone in. And you haven't fully allowed God to completely get in. You haven't allowed him into certain areas of your life. There are certain areas that he can come into that you're like, yeah, I need help with that. Can you come on in and help me with that? But then there are areas that are off limits. No, God, we're not going there. It's like we're visiting with God. We allow him into certain areas of our life. How many of you know what it's like to get ready when visitors are going to, you know, visitors are going to come over, and so you get your house ready? And you make the cookies that no one else is allowed to touch. My poor kids, I'll make something. They're like, do we get to eat it today, or is that for someone else? They know. One time I was mopping the floor, and they're like, who's coming over? It's not the only time I mop the floor. <laughs> kind of. <sighs> and so you get your house ready. But now in my house, there are people over at my house quite a bit. I have once a week uh, developmental therapies coming over for our daughter. Uh, once a week speech therapy is coming over for her. We have caseworkers. Um, uh, for our foster kids, we have caseworkers that are coming over all the time. I like to have other moms that are at home come over and hang out. So I have adult conversation during the day. And so there are people all the time. We have people that come in unannounced to check because we're in the foster system to have, uh, they need to come and do unannounced checks. And so my house, my living room and dining room and that one bathroom are clean. For the most part, if you come over to my house, those tend to remain clean. We have, a, we have a system, we, we clean that up. 
because there's a lot of people in the house. That is where I allow visitors. Don't go downstairs. My one requirement, well, one of my requirements for a house is that we would have a finish downstairs that I can throw kids, they can play, they can do whatever, and I don't have to see it. And so that's our downstairs. So I'm warning you that um, we have to be really close for you, for me to allow you to go downstairs. And so that's, and then upstairs is another story. We try, we try, but upstairs is another story. So I've got my areas where I will let you see when you come to my house. There are other areas that you're not going to see. How, do you, how many of you know what it's like to live with someone or have someone live with you? Not your spouse, but like other people outside of your family. Or maybe as adult children, yeah, <laughs> you guys are there. You know that feeling. You know having, like, like you can put on a show for a little while while people are living with you. And you're looking good and everyone's happy and the kids are behaving and all of this. Well, after a while, you, everyone's true colors are coming out. And you get to know each other really well. <laughs> And you get to see parts of other people that no one else sees because you're living together. God wants to abide in us. He doesn't want to just visit in our lives. He wants to have access to every area of our lives. John 1.14 uh, the message translation, I love how the message translation puts it. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved in to the neighborhood. God wants to move in. If you still have a wounded soul, God wants to move in there, not just visit you where you will allow him. He wants every area of your life. If there is a wound that is there that you have put a Band-Aid over and said, we're just going to pretend that's not there, we'll leave it alone, and it won't get any worse than it is, God says, take the Band-Aid off. Let me get in there and clean it out. Let me stitch it up. Let me in. How many of you have ever had a kid that has scraped their knee, got a cut, whatever, that needed to be cleaned? They're like, no, just put a Band-Aid on it. Somehow Band-Aids make everything better for kids. I just want a Band-Aid. No, it's got to be cleaned. We've got to scrub it. We've got to get the gravel out. We've got to get the dirt out. It's going to fester. It's going to be infected. It's going to, and they don't understand that. And they think you're the worst parent ever as you're trying to clean it out and you're trying to help them. You know that this is what is needed for complete healing to happen. God today is saying, let me in. It's going to hurt. I get that. We're going to visit places that you have locked up and said no one is going to. Give it to me. I promise you that at the end, when it's cleaned out and stitched up, true healing can begin. Your core, that muscle is going to be get, getting stronger and stronger so that you can live out the things that I'm calling you to do. But until you let me in, that muscle is going to be weak, and you will not be able to fully move and fully do all that I have called you to do. Let me in. And our minds. I think uh, this is a place that especially women struggle with. Our minds, they take us places. This is a, an area that the enemy knows he can get to uh, women for the most part easily. And so some of us today have come with tormented minds. Our thoughts, they take us somewhere. They take us to a destination. And our thoughts are like a, a train. They take us somewhere. There is a destination that they go to, but we have a choice whether we allow ourselves to get on that train or not. There, for some of us, there is a train that pulls into our minds as soon as we wake up, and it's a train that the destination is condemnation, guilt, defeat, negativity, insecurity, fear, doubt, greed, envy, jealousy, anger. But we allow ourselves every morning because it's familiar. Here it comes. Every morning we get on that train and we end up at the same destination over and over and over again. We need to choose. We get to choose what train we get on. But it's going to take practice if we've been in that same habit of, of heading on that same train. It's going to take practice to get out of that. 
when we lived overseas, we would go to Thailand, to, to Bangkok, Thailand quite a bit. Uh, it was kind of the hub for getting anywhere else that we wanted to go. It was a vacation spot, and um, it was also, there were great uh, hospitals there, and so the hospital had McDonald's and Starbucks. That's really why we chose it, but, you know, we have priorities. <laughs> and um, so we would go to Thailand, and they have a great railway system, a SkyTrain. A great system. You have to get to know it, but it, it is, it's phenomenal. It's how you move in, in the city. But I remember one time early on while we were getting the hang of, of the train, we got on, and on the train itself, it will have a map of the stops, and then they call out the stop. After you leave one stop, it will call off where the next stop is, is going, is where it's going to happen. And so we're sitting there, and we're looking at the map, and we're hearing them call out, and we're like, um, I think we got on the wrong one. You know, so, so we're listening and we're looking and like, yeah, yeah, that's not where we're going to go. And so we had to get off at the next stop and start over and reprogram and look at the map again. And go, okay, that's where we're going. We got it out. We're getting on. Some of us, our thoughts, moment by moment, we're going to have to take control of and say, I'm getting off. I know where this goes. I know where this train of thought goes. And I don't want to be there. I don't want to end up in that same place that I'm at every day day. I am getting off of this train. I'm putting something else in my mind, and I'm going to focus on that to get to a destination that I am choosing to go to. But you know, there are familiar trains that get, come, and we just get on because we've gotten on them so many times, and they're familiar. Even though we don't like the destination, it's familiar. But as we train our minds as we, as, we, as we reprogram our minds to get on the right train, those negative trains, those trains that lead to a destination we don't want to be at, you'll see them coming less and less. You'll see the opportunity to get on them less and less. But we are going to, in the beginning, have to get off that train a hundred times a day and say, I'm not going there. I'm getting off. Stop. I'm getting off. So how do we, how do we get on the next train? What do I do? We put the word of God in our hearts. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Train, the train will come in, and you can say no. It's not pure, it's not trustworthy, it's not lovely. I'm not getting on that train. Start quoting scripture. Grab your Bible, start reading whatever. I mean, just open it up, start reading. Get God's word in you. Turn on the praise and worship. Start worshiping him. Get off of those thoughts. Because so many times we get off at the end of the day, at the end of the day we wonder why, how did I end up here again? How did I get in that same place of depression, in that same argument with my spouse, in that same mess at home and at work? How did I get here? We got on the train and we stayed. Get off the train. Put God's word in your heart. Put scripture. Start memorizing scripture. Put it up all over your house. And just look, go to it, and say, this is what I'm going to think on. This is where I'm going to go. Because those trains, God's word, his praise and worship, it will lead you to life. It will lead you to a strong core that you can say, I've got this. I can do anything for God because my core is strong and where it should be. So we've got our strong core. We're ready for anything. We can build on anything. We, we are ready. We've got this. We've got God there in the center of us. We are strong, and we are ready to do whatever it is that God's calling us to do. So I want us to go back to where we started, the core of our message. Oh, I didn't mean that, but there you go. It works. The core of our message. <laughs> Proverbs 31, 26 again. It says she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. I love what uh, the message translation, how that puts it. It says she has something worthwhile to say and says it kindly. She has something worthwhile to say. She's not just opening her up her mouth to talk about whatever. She has something worthwhile to say, and she says it kindly. That's what I want. So this wisdom and this something worthwhile, it comes from the Bible. It comes from knowing God's word. That is where our wisdom comes from that we need to impart to our children that we need to impart to others, and that we need to impart to ourselves. And so we need to be in God's word. And I touched a little bit on this 
uh, during the mother-daughter dinner on Friday, and we're going to just revisit it a little bit deeper. But more than ever, so our first, our first area that we're talking about is what we say to our children, the wisdom and the kindness with which we speak to our children. And more than ever, our children need a biblical foundation for this life. We have the power to build up mighty men and women with our words and what we impart to them. But our kids don't need false encouragement. They need a biblical, solid foundation that they cannot argue with, that no one else can argue with. Unfortunately, right now, we are in a world that is speaking loudly to our children about their identity and about their worth. We can't just speak louder. We need to give them something to base their value, and their worth on. We need to equip our children for a fight, a battle that they are in. The Word of God tells us, talks to us about the armor of God that God has given us. We are in a battle. Whether you want to be or not, you are in a battle every day. And we need to put on the equipment, the armor of God that God has given to us. And we need to train our kids to do that. And all of the pieces of armor, except for one, are pieces that protect us for when we get attacked. But then we have one. We have our sword, the word of God, that we use to fight with. And that is what we need to train up our kids to do, is to know the word of God, to give them the word of God in their hand and show them how to use it. So that when the enemy comes, when lies come, they've got the word and they can fight it off for themselves. That we can pray the scripture over them <clears throat> We have to give our kids the weapon that they need. They come home and they're feeling stupid. Someone called them stupid at school. Maybe they're the worst one in math and they know it. Kids know it. Maybe they're the worst one. They're struggling in a situation or in a, in a, in a subject. And to be able to go, oh, honey, you're not stupid. It's okay. We'll get this. That might help for a moment, but that doesn't put worth and value in them. They need truth. They need something to base life off of. And you can tell them, I know that you're struggling in this area, but I also know that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And I know that whatever God has called you to do, he will equip you with whatever you need. If God is calling you to something that you're going to need math in, he's going to help you with that. It might be hard work, but he is going to do it. Whatever God has called you to, I know the plans of the, 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 that he has a plan and a purpose for you. And I promise you, he will give you whatever you need. Doesn't mean, like, stop doing your math homework. But it's giving them a biblical principle to stand on and say, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. What about those that come back saying I'm ugly? Oh, my goodness, how much are girls hearing this? You're fat, you're ugly, your hair, your clothes, whatever, whatever. To instill in our, our kids, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't matter if you're the prettiest. It doesn't matter if you're the ugliest. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that is what we base our worth on. Give them a solid foundation. Maybe your kids are saying, Mom, I've lied in the past. I know I've been a liar in the past. Or, Mom, I used to struggle with my anger. I don't anymore. But people keep telling me that I'm that. People keep saying I'm still a liar. People keep saying, oh, she is always mad. She's always angry. People keep saying these things of my past that I don't, I'm not anymore. Maybe it's your older kids that are coming and saying this to you. And you can remind them of the story of Matthew where he's sitting there. And he is, he is the least of the least. He, I mean, he, he is a thief. He is, a whole nation hates him. I mean, people, people hate him. And Jesus comes to him and says, Matthew, follow me. And everyone's like, whoa, 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 who I am? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he does? And Jesus is like, you see a liar, you see a thief, you see that, you see this. I see my disciple. I see someone that is going to follow me that he's going to become a missionary, that he is going to write the book of Matthew, that he is going to be a martyr for me. That is what I see. You tell them that story and say, listen, you have a past and people may see that. I see something more. This is what I see in you. When uh, we have one of our girls um, it's nice to have multiples of everybody because I can say he or she and you might not still be able to figure out who it is. 
But one of our girls, when she gets upset, when she gets hurt, she lashes out in anger. If she's embarrassed, she is mean. If she has had a rough day at school, someone has said something mean to her, she is nasty when she gets home. I mean, she's just mean. And to be able to speak to her and say, listen, you are acting like this, but I know who you are. And I've tried to start doing this more and more with her to say, you are kind. You are so sweet. You love to help people. Don't speak lies over your children. Speak truth. They know it's lies. They know what you're making up. Speak what is true in them and bring that out and call that out in them. When they are frustrated, when they are being horrible, say, that is not you. This is who you are. Just as Jesus looked at Matthew and said, you are not that, you are this. Let's do that in our kids. Give them that biblical principle to stand on. Maybe our kids are struggling uh, with a speech impediment or, or having trouble in speech class. I can't do this. I'm embarrassed. I can't do this. Story of Moses. Moses couldn't speak. He's like, God, you got to be kidding me. You can't be calling me. God enabled him and used him to save a nation. Tell your kids those stories. Bring the Bible into their everyday life. Take those stories out of just a Sunday school and help them apply it to their everyday life. Mom, kids are calling me a coward. I'm afraid to do this. I don't want to do this. Tell them the story of Gideon. Gideon's in a corner, he is a coward. He's, he's over there. He's hiding from everything. And God goes to him and says, you are a mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, you're talking to me. <laughs> sure, you're not talking to me. Tell them those stories and say, God took someone who was a coward, but he changed him and he did transform him into a mighty man of valor who won a mighty victory for God. That is what our kids need to hear we need to speak that wisdom. That is where the wisdom comes in, moms. To speak wisdom that comes from the word of God into our children's lives. And what about our speech to others? Our kids are watching, guys. It's fine if you tell them how wonderful and great they are. But more than ever, our kids need to see what is real and that we are living it out in every area of our lives, not just to them. Do not contradict yourselves. If you are telling your kids that they aren't stupid, make sure you're not calling your husband stupid. If you are saying that your kids have worth and value, make sure that they see you treating your neighbor with worth and value. If you are telling your kids that their past can be changed, they don't have to be held to the things that they used to be, then make sure that you're not holding a family member to that. Your kids are watching. They want to see what is real. Teaching to speak with kindness. If you are telling your kids to speak with kindness, you better be speaking with kindness. When I am yelling across the house, just be kind, it loses something. They know what is real. They know what is true. They want to see the real thing. We can go to, if you can't say anything nice, just don't say anything at all. Psalm 141.3 says, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That needs to be some of our prayers when dealing with other people. Guard me. Let me speak with wisdom. Just because it's true doesn't mean it needs to be said. Facebook, that's a whole nother sermon. Facebook is a whole nother sermon. Facebook has given people this boldness to have an opinion about everything. Just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it needs to be said. Speak with wisdom. We feel this need as soon as we see someone come and as soon as we see someone put something out there that we have to be in there and jump on the bandwagon and get on it. Guys, that train doesn't lead anywhere good. <laughs> Speak with wisdom. Slow down. Put a guard over your mouth when you're speaking with others and speak it with kindness. I think the hardest area for me is the what do our children hear us speaking to ourselves? I think women, we struggle with that. Because for me, this is the hardest area. If we have no worth for ourselves, our kids know that. 
Our words don't mean anything to them if they see us talking down to ourselves. Because you see, kids see us not through the eyes that we see ourselves with. They are pure and they are innocent and they think we are amazing. I love my kids still young. They think I'm awesome. <laughs> Most days. My 10 year old is, we're kind of there. Already changing. But they see us through eyes of innocence. And so when I stand there putting myself down, then my kids start to question, well, I think mom is awesome. She's saying she's stupid. Mom says, I'm awesome. Am I really? Do you get what I'm saying? We share a bathroom. We have one bathroom upstairs um, that we all, all eight of us share in the mornings. And one morning I was getting ready in there and I was with my girls and, um, I was, I, I was frustrated and, and whatever, and, and I looked in the mirror, and I said, well, that's as good as it gets today, and I threw my stuff in the drawer, and Hannah's standing there, she's four, and she goes, mommy, you're beautiful, mommy, you don't need makeup, your hair's so pretty, she got what I was saying, she understood that I was putting myself down. As much as I tell them how beautiful they are and how wonderful they are and how beauty doesn't matter and what we look like doesn't matter, I am standing in front of them saying, huh, it's as good as it gets. What does that say to them? What do they hear you saying about yourself? Whatever we would speak to our kids, we need to speak to ourselves. Bring ourselves to the scripture. What am I struggling with? Bring myself to those same scriptures I'm trying to teach my children. Because if it's, we're not living it out for ourselves and speaking it to ourselves, it will mean nothing to our children. Speaking kindness and speaking with wisdom to ourselves. Just as our physical core can become weak, there are seasons in our lives where maybe our core is strong. When I lived in Nepal, I had a much stronger core than I do now. There are seasons in our life where we can have a strong physical core, and then over time, we become lazy with our exercise or our eating or whatever, and our core becomes weak. But we have the opportunity to build that core back up. Same with our spiritual core. There are seasons where I am on. I've got this. I can change the world because I know who I am. And there are seasons where I have to get back in the Word and get back into the practices of just spending time with God and meditating on his word to build my core back up. It's seasons. It doesn't happen just one time. I wish I could build myself up physically one time, and that's it, and we're good to go for life. It doesn't work physically. It doesn't work spiritually. There are seasons. So I challenge you, if you are here today and you've come and you're trying to live out God's word through your broken heart, through your wounded soul, through your tormented mind, God today says, come. Let me heal those things. Let me strengthen that core. And then I will send you out. And you will be able to speak with wisdom and with kindness. Because you've got this. You're building on that foundation. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are able to build our core. And that you are the creator of our very being. And Father, I pray right now if there are those in here today that have come and they have come with a broken heart, a wounded soul, a tormented mind, that God, right now, you would begin healing that. That you would begin strengthening those muscles so that, God, they don't completely fail every time they're trying to live out your word, but they're building on a solid foundation. Minister to those this morning that just need to come back to the basics and get strength from you. Father God, for those that are here and your, their foundation is solid, God, they've got this. They've, they're in your word. They know your word. They're doing well. Bring them to the next level and show them how to live out their lives with wisdom and with kindness. God, as moms, give us words for our children. Show us how to bring our children to Scripture every day and to get into the Word and give them the equipment that they need to fight this battle that they are in. Thank you for the moms that are in this place. Thank you for the mighty, awesome men and women that they are raising up. 
Bless our moms today as we go out. Encourage us, strengthen us, give us the rest that we need, Lord God, so that we can be all that you, Lord God, have called us to be as moms and mighty, awesome women of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen.